Thank you for listening to The History of the Papacy. I'm Steve, and we are a member of the Agora Podcast Network. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find both by searching for A2Z History. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can always send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com. We are back on Patreon, and you can go over to patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy to find a great new way to support the podcast. I also love to see your ratings and reviews on iTunes. They really help me learn more about what you think about the show and what I can do to make it better. I'd also like to mention the Agora Podcast Network Podcaster of the Month, The Things That Made England by Royfield Brown and David Crowther. This is a really fun show where the hosts debate whether certain ideas, concepts, or items are quintessentially English or not. You can learn more at agorapodcastnetwork.com. Now, today we delve into one of the most important parts of day to day religion. The liturgy or the mass is how people engage with their religion, especially in Christianity. We are going to look at the foundation of the Christian liturgy and one of the most important sources for early liturgical practices the travels of Etheria. We will also talk about this fascinating travelogue while we're here. Thank you for joining me on this journey. It's going to be a fun ride. This is going to be the seventh year of the podcast, The History of the Papacy, and I've completely skimmed over probably the most important or at least the most practical part of Christianity and the church. All the ins and outs of theology, the history of the politics of the top-ranking bishops, the interaction between the church and state, and of course, the biographies of the popes of Rome are each more fascinating than the last. The fact is, though, most of the people sitting in the pews and who have sat in the pews for the past nearly 20 centuries have had minimal interest and certainly minimal impact on any of these events. The one thing that the common churchgoer does know a thing or two about is the liturgy. That is what they are most familiar with and how they engage most directly with the church. Whether it be called mass, liturgy, divine hours, or worship service, they all developed out of functions and ideas and foundations of the earliest church. We are going to look at how the liturgies of the church developed from earliest time to about the time of the so-called Dark Ages. We probably won't do this in one episode, but we'll do it over the course of a few episodes. The early Middle Ages was really the time where the liturgy settled in and took forms that are identifiable to this day. But let's see where they started. Now, Jewish liturgical practice is really the best place to start. The Jews had a a highly defined liturgical practice. It was a temple-based worship. The temple in Jerusalem focused and was the focus of the most important liturgical functions of Judaism. Priests, or kohanim, conducted burnt sacrifices of animals for the people. It's a very ancient worship style and connected to the Hebrew holy documents. There was just incredibly specific rules and regulations for how priests were to conduct this liturgical function. And it was really, it was a hands-off situation for the regular person. And they weren't even allowed in certain precincts, especially the most holiest places of the temple. Worship also revolved around a yearly cycle of religious holidays. It was based on a modified lunar calendar. This calendar had to constantly be adjusted and tinkered with to maintain accuracy. And a whole branch of science, really, was developed to make sure that this calendar was always in line with the times of the year that were so critical for their religion. Much time and research was invested in the calendar, and Christians will do this as well. The Jews had some big holidays. They still do have these holidays, Shavuot, uh, 
Sukkot, or Tabernacles, also called Pentecost in Greek, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, and also Pesach, or Passover, which was a very big deal, which was held in the Jewish month of Nisan, and which was a spring holiday. Now let's talk a little bit about the Law of Moses. These were very specific sets of guidelines for Jews to live by. We're always familiar with the kosher dietary laws, which are probably the most well-known, but there was many, many other rules of behavior that really governed almost every aspect of a person's life. There was also the synagogue. This was the teaching and learning place of the Jews, uh, it's where the regular person had the most contact with the religion. This is also where the rabbis, the teachers, or the leaders worked and did their part of the religion, as opposed to the priests who were focused in the temple. Each of these functions had cognates in other religions and sects in the Mediterranean world. The uniqueness of Judaism was and is how all these functions were combined. It really made for a well-rounded experience for the Jewish observer, the Jewish participant in their religion. Now, this is where early Christianity comes into the story. Here's, we'll have some discussion of the liturgy in the Gospels. There was some. Temple worship was definitely me- mentioned. The financial and the more day-to-day aspects of temple worship were certainly discussed. This is where the flipping of the money changers tables comes into play, where you're you're talking about the difference between the by the book and the lived experience of religion in that little vignette in the Gospels. Jesus and his family went to Jerusalem to visit the temple when Jesus was a kid, and that's a big story. All of these and more places place Jesus in a completely second temple Jewish context. And if you've listened to any of the other episodes that I've done with Gary Stevens, or if you've listened to Gary Stevens' History in the Bible podcast, you'll know a lot about second temple Judaism. In the gospel, some of the essential elements of the liturgy were laid out. Liturgy really became central to Christian worship. You have the Sermon on the Mount, which is in the Gospel of Matthew, and then the Sermon on the Plain, which is in the Gospel of Luke. Both the Gospels of Luke and Matthew each give a description of Jesus performing a sort of proto-liturgy, if you will. If you want to read them yourself, you can go to the Gospel of Matthew, which is where this is detailed in chapters 5 and 6. And in the Gospel of Luke, it's in a good place to start is chapter 5, but then you skip forward a bit, and then chapter 11 has more. I'll quote a bit from the New King James Version, as I usually do from Bible Gateway as we progress in this episode. You have the Our Father prayer, the Lord's Prayer, from both Matthew and Luke. They're a little different. Then you have, uh, in this these two chapters, includes anointing with oil, which is a big deal, parables, which will really be a big deal in liturgy, and the Beatitudes. A really big part of it is also the Eucharist, or the Last Supper Passover liturgical meal. Each of the four canonical Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, have something about this Eucharist in or Last Supper in their narratives. Jesus says, eat this bread as my body and drink the, this wine as his blood in his memory. A bloodless or spiritual sacrifice of the lamb, symbolically Jesus. This is in contrast, comparison to the Jewish physical sacrifice of animals, the lamb being the primary one or the most important one on Passover. The book of Acts and the epistle of the Corinthians also has liturgical functions. Acts mentions breaking of bread. Corinthians says Eucharista, which is the Eucharist and the breaking of bread. We also have baptism mentioned in the Gospels. Major, the major part of Christianity is the practice of baptism, which really goes back to the beginning. 
It's connected to Second, Second Temple Jewish ritual bathing. In the early church, it usually happened in the time running up to the Easter or Passover time of the year, particularly either the week before or the very night before the Passover Easter celebration. It's always important when we talk about Easter. Easter is the word that became popular in English to the Anglo-Saxons and in German for the Passover. If you look at any other European language, it's usually some form based on Passover, Pesach, and almost any other uh, Romance language or even other Germanic languages. It's really a Germanic language thing for the most part to use this word Easter instead of Passover for for the celebration of what we would call Easter. So I'll go back and forth. I will probably call it Easter for our sakes here because most people will be most familiar with that. A big part also, as we mentioned earlier, was this anointing with oil. It's in Christianity. It becomes called chrismation, and it's an incredibly important part of early Christian practice. It's also called the sealing of the Holy Spirit. This came from both Jewish and Eastern Mediterranean, Middle Eastern practice of using oil to anoint people and to seal them. It was uh, kings were anointed with oil. In Eastern Christianity, as we've seen in other episodes, the anointing of oil was more what finalized someone becoming a Christian than even baptism. Let's go and try and take a look at the earliest liturgy, or at least as much as what we can figure out. Most of the elements, like the really broad, like when you really get into that word element, like the basics used back then were even in play back then. There was a teaching component and a sacramental component. There was a synthesis also of the synagogue and temple worship. All of this came out of the buffet of ideas available to a second temple Jew, which who really Christians were. They were second temple Jews who were choosing from this buffet and adding it to their idea of Jesus. Let's go to Justin Martyr first. He was working in about the 150 AD CE time range. He said that there were some basic components. One included readings from the mem- memoirs of the apostles, and that's a section of the liturgy where the gospels or the some of the major letters that went back and forth in the apostolic age were read. Then there was an Old Testament reading section, a sermon or a teaching speech or lecture, the breaking of bread and the mixing of water and wine, A prayer of thanksgiving was followed by the recitation of the word amen, or so be it, which would lead to our word amen, by those in attendance. All of this was led or presided by a bishop connected to the Levitical priesthood. The Really, in this way, the rabbi and the priest were combined into one in the earliest Christianity. The teaching and litur- the sacramental functions were combined into one person, the bishop. Even at this earliest time, attendance at Sunday worship was considered mandatory. Despite Christianity not being legal, potential for legal penalties for being in attendance could get you in big trouble with the Roman authorities, but people were still required to be there. Fasting was normal. Jews customarily fasted weekly on Mondays and Thursdays. Christians fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays weekly. Some places included Saturdays as well. Interestingly enough, even the pagans fasted on certain days of the week. So this is these are broad common cultural traits of fasting. Their day was often on Thursday, which in the Roman idea was Jupiter's day. That's where you get in languages such as Spanish, Jueves, or in French, Jovdi, Jove's day or Jupiter's day. In the East, now we have 
before we get to the east-west divide, let's look at the Lenten and longer fast periods, which developed very early in Christianity. In the East, the very earliest fasting time during the pre-lead up to the Paschal Easter celebration was a fast of only about a week, the week before the past, the Christian Passover Easter. Though in the Western, they are more in what we are more familiar with the 40 day before Easter fast. Later, the East adopted the pre-Easter fasting that the West used of 40 days plus the week before Easter. So they're coming out at about 50 days. As with the liturgy, fasting and other practices had much regional variation, but we will get into this more in this episode and in future episodes. A, a very famous pilgrim named Etheria saw a good deal of this diversity in practice. Now, some time ago, I checked my email, and over two and a half years ago, a listener named Guy suggested the topic of the pilgrimage of Etheria. This is just a great story, but it never really fit into other, any other episode, and I just kept putting it on the back burner, putting it on the back burner. Well, today is the perfect day to discuss this great story, which you'll soon see why. And I want to thank Guy so much for suggesting this topic and being so patient for me, patient for me to get to the topic. We have to go way back to start this one. The pilgrimage of Etheria is likely from the 300s AD. A woman, possibly named Etheria, possibly traveled from Western Europe to the Holy Land. Now, she kept a very detailed travel log of what she see, saw and experienced, especially what she observed in liturgical and ecclesiastical matters. This will be very helpful for our discussion today. So why many possiblies? The document was only mentioned and quoted in the Middle Ages, so a few hundred years after the 300s. There were two incomplete versions that were found about a hundred years ago. So before, they were really only mentions in the Middle Ages. But the actual documents were discovered in the late 1800s. The only problem is about only about the middle two thirds of the document are extant. The scholars estimate that about uh, roughly a third of the beginning is gone and about a, roughly a third of the end. So there's still quite a bit that is missing. The manuscript we have today doesn't say it was written by anybody in particular. We know that it was a woman, but the woman's name could have been Elheria, Elergia, Elergia, Eletheria, or Eletheria. And again, these this naming is based on some various conjectures, especially from Middle aged documents from the Middle Ages. It is usually said she was from Galicia in Hispania. We've talked about Galicia in Spain in other episodes and in upcoming episodes. Some of the evidence of why she was from that particular area was the way she wrote Latin. So, and then there's also evidence that, based on her Latin, that she might have been from Gaul and a couple other things. She compares many of the rivers that she sees in the Middle East and Egypt to the Rhone River. But in some ways, that may have been the biggest river that she was familiar with. She would have almost certainly saw that in her travels. And there was a trade connection between Galicia and southern France, or Gaul, where the Rhone River is located. In one way or the other, it really points that she was well-traveled within the Western Mediterranean as well. For the most part, this was really, this whole idea of where Etheria, what her name was, and where she was from, was really fought out in scholarly works and journals in the first few decades of the 20th century. Most scholars agree in the end, that she was from somewhere in the northwestern Hispania, northwestern region of modern-day Spain. 
she may have been a lay person, but there's also, in some respects, she could have been a woman of a monastery or even the abbess of a monastic community. We're 99% certain that she was a woman of means. There's really no way that somebody who was poor could have made the travel in the way that she made the travel. Now, somebody of less means could have gone on a pilgrimage and lived hand to mouth and made it across the Mediterranean. But somebody of you would have had to have had some means to travel the way that she did, send letters the way she did, and really travel in style like she did. Now, let's get back to when she wrote this. It's really likely that she was from approximately the 380s time frame. This is really based on some of the things she mentions and some of the things she fails to mention, especially some of the buildings and the churches. She was very detailed on what she saw as far as church buildings go. So you kind of have to, scholars at least, are saying, well, it's kind of an absence of evidence. If she was so careful in listing certain church buildings that she saw and she didn't mention some, then that's at least a hint that that building may not have been built yet. Now, this 380s time frame is really key. It's very early. It's just really a few years after Constantine converted to Christianity. I mean, less than only about 50 years later. Some of the fundamental theological controversies, the very earliest ones, are still raging. It's also right about the time that Theodosius, a fellow Spaniard, took over the empire. It's the beginning of the Germanic groups moving into the empire. This is about the time that the Goths crossed over the Danube and started to really make a mess in the Balkans and Greece and the Middle East. So big issues. The Battle of Adrianople and more. Yet, travel was still quite easy and safe, at least relatively. I mean, she was able to make it from one end of the empire to basically the exact opposite, like the farthest away you could get. And she did it safely. There was no mention of any attacks by pirates or anything like that. And she probably would have mentioned that. Now, there's some scholars who place a theorist pilgrimage up to 150 years later, but that's really the minority dis, uh, thought. And that's based on a couple of other factors. But I, I think we're comfortable to say that we'll go with the more common date of the 300s. Now, travel was much easier across the Roman Empire at that time than it would be even 50 years later, but let alone 150 or 200 years later. A rather well-to-do woman could make this long trip with a reasonable expectation of safety. That would not have been the case, uh, and really far from it, say, in the early 500s. And really, I mean, it's it's worth saying again that Etheria must have been way more than just a woman of the her, the average financial means. She must have had some serious scratch, if you will, to get that far and travel in relative luxury along the way. It just it really took some serious financial resources to do that. Now, with all these ifs and maybes and possiblies and likelies out of the way, where did Etheria go? We have that because her itinerary says where she goes. Now, the itinerary starts in the middle of her narrative in Sinai in Egypt. That's that triangular piece of land between Egypt proper and Africa and then Israel and the Levant in Asia. She went to the place of the burning bush and then climbed Mount Sinai, and it was a tough hike for her. She went out part of the way in a litter, so you know what a litter is. It's some, It's kind of like a carriage, but it's a, it's a carriage where people carry it. And the person inside of the litter was usually in, on some sort of a couch, so definitely like top-of-the-line transportation. 
again, says something about her financial situation. At some point, the slope became too steep and she had to continue the arduous walk the rest of the way by herself. At this point, she worked her way around the sites in the region of the Sinai Peninsula, which again is the, the includes the modern day northwest Saudi Arabia, southern Israel, and then that chunk of Egypt, that triangular chunk of Egypt. She went to what would become St. Catherine's Monastery, the supposed location of where Moses met with God through the burning bush. This was a very important site to Christianity at that time. Not much is known of the condition of the monastery at this point in the late 300s. Major renovations would occur in the 500s during Justinian, which is one of the kind of the reasons why you could place her traveling at a later date, that maybe the location wasn't actually there in the 300s. But that's um, we'll put that aside for the for the time being. St. Catherine's is actually interesting because it has the longest continuously operated library in the world. Many, many important texts are located there. For centuries, this library was not very well organized. And, it, and this whole monastery had a very difficult history with a variety of conquerors, the Byzantines, the, the Islamic armies, the Ottomans. I mean, just about anybody who came through that, uh, that major corridor went through where St. Catherine's was, but it was able to survive. It also, a little fun fact, is that it has the oldest continuously standing roof truss in the world. The whole complex is located inside of a massive Roman military fortress. The pictures of it will give you a very good view of what this is. Now, Etheria moves on from there. She spent Epiphany in the city of Arabia, which was in the northern section of the Hejaz, which is the the northeastern section of modern-day Saudi Arabia, most likely. She was assigned a detail of soldiers for protection during parts of her travels in this region. So what does that mean? Wealthy travelers at this point needed some sort of protection in this area. It was really a frontier zone where troops held, helped make the trade and travel safer. And it's just an, yet another example that Etheria had the means that even if she didn't pay for these soldiers, it's possible that they were assigned to her because she was a wealthy traveler and the government didn't want her to be waylaid in this frontier zone. She visited many of the sites that Moses visited uh, and that were named in the Old Testament in Egypt, Sinai, and Northern Arabia. This shows the really important connection between Old Testament sites and views and early Christianity. They've, she mentions uh, Old Testament sites very, very often in her itinerary. Now, she was um, on the move again in the late December, early January season during the Epiphany time. She traveled northward toward Jerusalem. It was safe enough at this point that she didn't need a military or a police escort anymore. It really shows how much things had changed in the environs of Roman Palestine at this point. It was much, much less dangerous than the times of the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was about 150 years earlier. She spent Epiphany in Jerusalem, but then had a, she had a relatively short stay, and then she hit the road again. Her next stop, she moved on to the eastern side of the Dead Sea and worked her way up the uh, Jordan River Valley. She hit up many important sites, including Mount Nebo. She visited churches and many tourist sites of it that were important and minor. Then she swung herself back to Jerusalem. She visited the tomb of Job, one of many possible burial places of Job, which um, merits a quick mention that she is revisiting some of the places that she had been up to three years previously. I mean, she's on quite a long journey. This is a serious pilgrimage she was on. 
Then she went up into that, into Mesopotamia, and many, many sites in what is now southern Turkey, as far away as the city of Haran, or Karhia. She went through Antioch twice on her way to Edessa. She visited sites around the story of King Abgar. The long story short is that King Abgar was the king of Edessa who was in communication with Jesus during the earliest time. This is sort of a legendary or, um, depending on your point of view, legendary or a non-canonical story. It wasn't found in any of the Gospels, but it is is and was widely believed by Christians to occur. We've discussed this in a previous episode. It's a very interesting story and extremely popular in Eastern Christianity. Etheria swings back to Antioch and then on to Tarsus, and again in southern, ter- modern day southern Turkey. She says this is her second time visiting Tarsus. Probably she would have visited on her arrival journey to the Levant and Holy Land. She visited the Church of St. Thecla, which um, Thecla was a very, very important saint in ancient times and even today in Eastern Christianity. Thecla was an early follower of Paul. It's really a great story. Thecla was a woman who stuck with Paul through thick and thin, even though Paul would sometimes deny her. It really showed that she had, it was meant to show how incredibly strong a faith that Thecla was and how sometimes, you know, Paul would falter. A great story. Thecla was important in early Western Christianity, but sort of faded out in popularity in the Middle Ages. But she was always particularly popular amongst women. At this point, they skip through the the major part of the journey of how Etheria got from Tarsus to Constantinople. That would have been interesting. I mean, this is just me talking here, but it would be a fairly difficult land journey. But there would have been a lot of good Christian sites to hit up, but she could have also taken a sea journey that would have been a relatively more easy and she could have still hit up some other Christian sites. So I'm, you know, just guessing here, but she may have very well taken that sea route and that's why she skipped over all of the things that she saw if they were kind of in a hurry to get from Tarsus up to Constantinople, because I think she would have mentioned if she had seen some cool sites along the way either through a sea journey or a land journey. Now let's talk a little bit about what she saw in Constantinople. The only way I could describe it, I think, is to say it's like somebody today visiting Dubai or Las Vegas. Everything newly, was newly constructed. I mean, it was just on a monumental scale, like the city of the whole world. I mean, somebody like Etheria and probably most of anybody in the entire Western world, you know, from Europe, uh, Western Asia, on, on westward, would have never seen anything like it. I mean, buildings and secular buildings, churches, shops, everything just built to show off wealth and power. It must have been very impressive, especially for someone from northwestern Hispania, which was a nice area, but was definitely rural and off the beaten path. And it would have compared with anything that she would have saw on her many journeys. And that's really that's the end of the itinerary of Etheria. She she wrote back to her friends in Hispania with this uh, with this travel log or journey and says that as long as she lives, she uh, has some other projects and planned in mind. So she must have, you know, been planning to do some other big things. I'd love to know what else she had in mind and what else she actually did. It almost gives me idea to write a little Etheria fan fiction and say what else she did once she finished her travels. Maybe she went to Rome. Maybe she went back to the east and traveled around there. I mean, the possibilities are endless. If you'd like to have a little fan fiction, maybe I will put that into the hopper of episodes.
I would also like to know how she traveled from Hispania to the Middle East and uh, to Constantinople and back. Like, you know, what was going on? I mean, there's a very good possibility that she died in the East, depending especially on what age she was at the time. But it, there's a good chance that she went back to Hispania and shared all these interesting things. These ancient travel logs are just so much fun and show how relatively easy it was to travel if you had the money and the time. Most people didn't have the money and they definitely didn't have the time. It's really interesting, too, because what I've described so far was only about half of the book. The rest of the book is a detailed description of the liturgical practices that she witnessed in the East. These descriptions are incredibly important for scholars. They show how many different practices were done in the East and how liturgical practices, calendar cycles developed and were, were actually practiced by people day to day. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of what Etheria saw liturgically in the churches. Many of the churches that she visited had individual practices that were different from the other churches that she visited. Etheria describes the individual Psalms, the Old Testament passages, and a set, etc. that they read at each one of these individual churches. The, the practices were incredibly diverse, church by church with different things going on. To this day, individual churches in the Middle East and the Holy Land do something uh, to, to that effect, but maybe not quite as differently as it was done in Etheria's time. Thing is, Etheria seemed pretty comfortable with this. She never bashes it. To her, it just is what it is. She isn't like um, maybe somebody like Augustine is later who's complaining to his uh, mentor, Ambrose, in Rome, which, you know, he's writing from what Augustine knew was in Milan, a couple of hundred miles away. And he's like, oh, this, um, can you believe in Rome they're doing X, Y, and Z? Etheria never seems to really have a problem with that. Etheria describes each of the daily offices, a liturgical service with specific prayers that was conducted several times per day. But each one of these did not include a Eucharist, which is the ultimate practice that was only done during the the Mass or the Divine Liturgy. There was matins or morning prayers, sext and nones, which were midday prayers. Those changed depending on the time of the year and where the sun was. The Romans conducted their calendar. An hour wasn't a set time limit like it is today. An hour could change based on the length of the, the seasonal length of the day. The end was vespers and end of day prayers. These are all called the liturgical hours, and they're still practiced to this day to varying degrees, depending on where they're done. In a local church, they probably are done a little bit less than they are in a monastery. And depending on east and west, they might be conducted in a different way. A theorist also described the church space. She refers to the Anastasius or the Anastasis, which is the re- the word means resurrection in Greek. The name she this is also she uses this for the name of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. She also seems to use this word Anastasis as the altar area of the church. It sounds like she's sort of referring to the iconostasis area of a modern-day Eastern Orthodox Church, or um, what's also called the chancel of a modern Western Church. It's basically the sacred area around the altar, where for the most part only clergy are allowed. It's really a very good description of the various churches she visited in and around Jerusalem. She describes them in really good detail, important detail. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Etheria spent Epiphany, or the early January season, through the Easter Paschal celebration in and around Jerusalem, which can be as late as late April, early May. So she's there about roughly a quarter of the year. Um, quarter to a third of the year. 
beginning of the year. She describes the Lenten season as practiced in Jerusalem in quite detail. Many of the aspects are quite familiar. Others are unusual or in a proto form that would develop into things that are practiced and conducted all the way to this time. A theory also goes on to describe Palm Sunday and the week before Easter. A theory points out that the locals call it Great Week. There's very large and important processions conducted during Palm Sunday from the Anastasis to the Mount of Olives. She talks about Holy Monday, Holy or Maundy Thursday, and the Good Friday services. They are all very busy days of the week during this during this Holy Week time. Uh, the relic of the true cross is brought out, and this was possibly that same true cross that Helena, the mother of Constantine, found, and it's probably was the whole cross or something very close to that before it was, you know, pieces of it were cut off, etc. And so it could be the, you know, obviously it may or may not be the original true cross. It depends on how much you stock you put in Helena's that's tale of the Helena, the mother of Constantine's tale. The, uh, after that, Etheria goes into the entire schedule of Holy Saturday. After that, then she goes into the Sunday, what happens on the Sunday after the evening Paschal services. The Paschal services really would start the, on Saturday before before the Pascha or Easter, and then they go all the way into Sunday night, and then a little break, and then all day Sunday. There's a ton of religious observance during this week and that entire weekend. I mean, and there really wasn't much time for rest worked in. It must have been exhausting, and Etheria did all of it. Etheria then goes on to describe what is called either Pentecost or Whitson um, in the more Eng- English version, Whitson. Um, most other places call it Pentecost. This takes place approximately 50 days or seven weeks after Easter. So again, you're putting Etheria spent from late December all the way up into the uh, summer, probably sometime in as late as June in in and around Jerusalem. Again, a lot of detail. One interesting point, though, bishops, before they would baptize and chrismate a person, they did a really detailed investigation of each catechumen that included interviews with friends and neighbors. So they were really doing their due diligence into each person who wanted to convert to Christianity. We're not getting what there probably were mass conversions, but they're not just converting people. Fairweather friends at this point, which is is interesting because you're talking again, 50 years after Constantine, where a lot of people are becoming Christians because that's kind of the way the wind's blowing. Now, the narrative ends right in the middle of the discussion of the dedication of some churches. That's really the unfortunate part of Etheria's letter. We just don't know what happened next. It could be anything. Also notice Etheria never speaks about any theological controversies. Nothing about Arianism, Docetism, Apollinarianism, which was gaining some steam at about this time, Adoptionism, Gnosticism, or any of the other dozen or so non-Orthodox, non-Nicene movements that were going on at this time and at this place. Even Marcionism was still going fairly strong in some of the places that Etheria visited at this time. All of these controversies were alive and well in the various locations where Etheria visited. Now, I think Etheria would have had knowledge of at least some of these heresies. Maybe the travel agency or whoever organized her trip purposefully avoided this, Maybe in practical terms, it was hard to distinguish the various groups for someone who was probably not a theologian. But again, 
it, it that still doesn't make sense to me. She would have known the controversies. But again, maybe in day-to-day practice, various groups in the Middle East went along to go along more than the documentary evidence would suggest. Maybe it wasn't out-and-out battles in the street or these groups, they did their own thing. But again, I think that that's something she would have mentioned in such a detailed travel narrative. So we're going to leave it at this today. There's just so, so much to talk about. But we do have to get back to the 6th century, and I, I, there's some things that I don't want to skip over. I want to, when it comes to liturgy, I want to spend a little bit more time on this. was a really good overview and a chance to get into a bit of detail on this wonderful travel diary of a woman of the late 300s who really, I mean, did a did a tour of the Middle East that would make a lot of people jealous today, me included. I will definitely discuss the topic of liturgy more in the future. You know, having said that we just scratched the surface today, we did get that fun personal story, and I think that it was definitely worth every second of the time taken to talk about the itinerary of Etheria. In the next installment of the liturgy, we'll talk about the Didache, more connections between Christian and Jewish liturgy in the Second Temple, coming out of that Second Temple period, and the development of liturgy into the early medieval period, particularly in the West. We will also be talking with Gary Stevens uh, in the upcoming time about some of the issues surrounding the so-called Q source and the synoptic problem. This will provide a big amount of context for the development of Christian liturgy. You know, liturgy is where actual people engage with the church and Christianity. For the most part, they aren't reading the theological tracts. They've read or may have read in the, you know, depending on the time period, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the liturgy may also be the only time where they hear or read from those books. So you're working your day to day life back then. Maybe you were a farmer, didn't have access to books. So the only time you were really engaging with the religion, right, was when you went there on Sunday and you heard those lessons. Maybe it's today and you're busy and, you know, the average Christian doesn't have time to really, you know, delve into these different uh, aspects of their religion, but they do go on Sundays. So that's really where the rubber hits the road. The liturgy is really where these people are getting taught the message of that the church wants to teach. So that's why it's so critically important. I can't wait to talk more about this subject. And as always, send in your questions, comments, and feedback about any of these topics to my email, steve at a2zhistorypage.com, Facebook and Twitter, where you can search for History of the Papacy or A2Z History Page. You can always submit a comment to my website, atozhistorypage.com. I will also post an episode with the complete audio of the Travels of Etheria from LibriVox or LibriVox. I'm not sure how they say that. I edited the tracks to make it a bit e- more easy to listen to. You can always download it from their website, but everything's all uh, open license. So I took it's a bit difficult to download it from their website, but I combined it. So look for that soon. And I'll do a, just a little brief intro, which they do a very nice intro of the of the book as well. But look for all of that in the future and more, and I will talk to you next time.